Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. It's rare we do a show where probably everyone in the audience has heard of the company, but today is one of those days because we are going to sit down and have a conversation with the CEO, President and CEO of Cumberland Farms, Ari Hasiotis. Ari, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ted. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. So, as I say, everyone knows Cumberland Farms, but mm -hmm. what they may not know is uh, have a sense of the full scale of it. As a, yeah. It's a very large enterprise. Can you give us a sense how many employees, how many stores, yeah. what the revenue is? Yeah, so uh, very large indeed, uh, over 7,500 team members, employees as we refer to them, team members within our company, 560 plus stores and growing across eight states, uh, primarily the Northeast, but also down into the Florida market as well. Uh, revenue for the retail business in excess of three and a half billion dollars for the retail business. So. Certainly big and, and again growing. And you wanted to get bigger, I'm sure, as a CEO. Very always. much so. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the questions I got when I told people to come on, they said, You have to ask him, was there a Cumberland farm and Cumberland, Rhode Island? And there yeah. absolutely was. So it was owned by your grandparents. So That's right. can you tell people about the company's local roots? Yeah, I can. And it, there was, in fact, a Cumberland farm. My grandparents uh, came here from Greece uh, and were proud of the story. They came here really with nothing. Uh, ultimately buying a small farm in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Uh, in the and, 1930s, I yeah, think, Yeah, right? in the 30s. And from there, you know, beginning with just one cow, milking the cow, using some of the excess milk they didn't need for their large family, and there were eight kids in the family, uh, to sell maybe to some neighbors. And then with another cow, they could expand their distribution. My dad, uh, my uncles, my aunts, all involved in the business throughout a real family business growing up on the farm. Uh, and working with their hands every day to build a business together, which ultimately led, of course, to the Cumberland Farms retail store business. And yeah. and I'm curious about that too. Obviously, there are a lot of farm. There were a lot of farmers in the 30s. Yeah. Not many of them created a <clears throat> convenience store behemoth. How did yeah. they end up? Your family going from being farmers, they had yeah. milk. They probably sold wholesale, I assume, yeah. and such, to yeah. saying we're going to be retailers ourselves. Yeah. So I think you know some of it, of course, is probably fortuitousness, and maybe they saw some things others didn't. Uh, they certainly. Tried traveled a bit, you know, I know some of the family members went out to the, the heartland of the United States at that time and saw some of the other things going on in, in the dairy markets there, but ultimately a very entrepreneurial family, uh, driven in large part by my grandmother, which for the time, you know, in that era oh, yeah. was very rare uh, for a woman to be really the driving force behind the family. But she really pushed, uh, pushed her children hard, wanted to see them succeed, not having, again, had very much financially uh, as a family as they started out. She wanted to see her kids, her family get ahead, push them hard to succeed, and they ultimately came up with the idea to open a store, and that turned into one, and then many, and then hundreds, of course. Uh, was there a me. moment where they realized, this is going to be a very big company. We're not going to have two, three stores. This is going to be large. Yeah, you know, I, th I, think, I think there was. I think as they started to grow in the 50s, uh, you know, there were, there were uh, times when they were adding, you know, handfuls of stores per week. They, they felt that they were really on to something, pioneering in the New England market, really one of the first to sell a jug of milk in a gallon jug. Yeah, because our younger viewers might not realize there weren't, there weren't a lot of, con there wasn't convenience stores really before exactly. the 50s, right? Yeah, and it's, and it's funny because we say, how does that not, how does that uh, happen? Yeah, you think but, you need them, yeah. Yeah, and, but it was a it was a door-to-door -door delivery up until that time, and the idea of putting milk on a shelf in a gallon jug was really like a novel concept. <laughs> so they were able to do that, and, and of course, selling it at one location versus delivering it, they were able to do it at a very attractive retail price, and, of course. Uh, you know, everyone looking to save a dollar recognized that value. And, and it really kind of built upon itself from there. Yeah. Now, you're third generation in Correct. your family to yes. be at the helm of this business. Uh, did you, ex growing up, did you yeah. did you know is it kind of end you, son? You will uh, someday be the CEO. Hardly, no. no. It was, uh, you know, it's a big family. A third, um, as you uh, as you mentioned, a third generation family member, but many many members of my generation. Uh, it, I think again, it's. Uh, uh, I had certainly an interest in the business from a very young age and was in and out of stores with my dad really from a young age working in stores even as b before I was old enough to ring a register legally I was stocking shelves and stocking milk in the coolers and and then ultimately was very much attracted to the business and saw what the brand meant to New England and thought 
gee, it would be nice to be able to work at the company someday. And as, as I guess luck and hard work would have it, uh, was able to uh, be in a position to have been given the privilege, and it really is, to be able to lead the company today. And some folks might assume you uh, you walked in, maybe you're 22, and they said, okay, yeah. you're the CEO now, but you actually, you were a store manager That's right. for yeah. a time. What was yeah. that like? That's the toughest job I ever had. To, really? Really. And, and I'll tell you, that has never left my mind. You know, the, the work I did as a store manager, which I did immediately after graduating from college, and I remember so many of my friends, you know, laughing at me, yeah. saying, you're going to go be a convenience store manager <laughs> and I said you know I need to learn our business uh, and uh, it was a tough job long hours you know day, you know all day long sometimes all night long as well on holidays on weekends um, and what you learn through that experience so what I learned certainly is uh, you know never to forget the folks the team members in our stores that really make the wheels turn every day so it's an experience I will never ever regret uh, certainly, again, the hardest job I ever did, but so much even to this day, I think back to those times when I ran a store and said, how would that have affected mm -hmm. me if I was in a store, leading a store team? How would the team members in the store feel about this decision? And I think it's really helped. It certainly helped me. I hope it's helped the organization as now, well. Now, did your, did your employees know that, uh, were you kind of undercover boss, or did your employees know that, uh, oh, this is the grandson of the founders, actually? No, I, th I think it was pretty well known. You know, yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, it was a, it was a situation where uh, I wanted to come in. I wanted to start at that level. I think many respected the fact that I wanted to start oh, sure, at yeah. that level. Um, but, you know, it's a big business. So there were probably some skeptics that were looking <laughs> at me saying, hey, you know, what's this all about and what does this mean? But uh, I think what we've tried to do, and, and certainly I've tried to do it, is, is show everyone across the company that I'm willing to do the jobs. That, that I would never ask someone to do a job in our company that I wouldn't do or haven't done at some point in my life. So uh, one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on today, we're going to talk a lot about yeah. it, is everyone's noticed this rebranding. Yeah. It's more than a rebranding. Yeah. Uh, this, this effort by Cumberland Farms, new types of stores, new products, mm -hmm. new, new, tons of new things. A lot right. of it's coincided with you taking the helm. Um, yeah. Before we talk about the specifics of what changes have been made, can you take us back to 2008, 2009, when you started to implement these changes? What yeah. did you look out and see in the competitive landscape that yeah. made you say, we need to, mm -hmm. we need to um, embrace some new ways of doing yeah. things? So first of all, and I think it's a fantastic question, we, we recognize, certainly I recognize that we had a very strong brand, very well known in New England, very well trusted in New England, uh, and we thought we really had the potential, some real latent potential in that brand to take it to greater heights. Um, adding on to that, uh, we've seen a lot of blurring across channels, you know, uh, the drug channel selling milk, right? Uh, the, the, the quick serve restaurants uh, selling coffee, right? And vice versa. So we've had to really understand how do consumers approach getting the items they need every day to get through life and thinking through that lens, are we providing what they need in our environment with our stores, which are very, very conveniently located, easy to get into, easy to get out of, quick service, quick checkout. And so we looked across the landscape and said, are we providing kind of a fulsome you know, product mix to our customers? In addition to that, very truthfully, uh, Ted, we were seeing some, some issues with mm -hmm. our business. Motor fuel, you know, gasoline primarily, is declining. Probably a good thing for the environment long term <laughs> with you know, emissions and sure. so on. Uh, but when you're in a business running a business and you're relying upon these products, Cars are getting more efficient. Again, a good thing socially, but it has an impact on, our, on the top line of our Absolutely. business. Likewise, tobacco. Convenience stores are long known as really the, the, the preeminent place in which to purchase tobacco products. Tobacco, again, socially good, but declining. Mm -hmm. So when you sit where I sit and you think about two key product lines in decline, and then you look at a great brand with a heritage in dairy and fresh products, with great locations, uh, we said we think we can really make a very big and aggressive push into food and beverage. All right, and we're going to talk about that push great. and what you've been doing when we come back from a break. So you won't want to miss it. Stick with us on Executive Suite. That is 
Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're talking today with Ari Hasiotis. He is the president and CEO of one of the most iconic brands in New England, Cumberland Farms. And uh, Ari, you were saying before we went to the break that you looked out 08, 09, and that period, you saw some uh, strategic challenges and also some opportunities, mm-hmm. which is what led to these new stores that yeah. people are seeing. So yeah. what is... What's so new about these new stores? Yeah. They look different, but there's more than certainly, that, right? Yeah. Well, we hope certainly uh, the watchers are, are noticing what we've been doing, and we've been investing very, very aggressively to put forth our new, new concept stores. And really, at the heart of it, Ted, what we call these new stores is food-centric. So very, very much about fresh food, about hot food, about freshly prepared food. Uh, we've got a very significant focus on coffee, both the hot variety and the cold variety, and we've put a lot of emphasis organizationally around the coffee business. Very, very important part of our business. We think our coffee is really, really fantastic, and we put it up against any out there in the marketplace. Customers can come in, and they'll be presented with a really, really tremendous and compelling uh, array of options in the coffee category. Again, be that hot or iced. We've got fountain soda. We've got frozen slush drinks. We've got milkshakes. We've got pizza that's served hot. I actually yeah. didn't oh, yeah. And they're really now. fantastic. <laughs> True, authentic milkshakes, uh, you know, between the pizza, the really terrific hot dogs, we've got uh, toasted sandwiches. It's got a significant fresh food uh, centric component to the store. Now, I know in the mid Atlantic, maybe mm-hmm. there's been, there was a culture of convenience stores having yeah. this fresh food yeah. thing. Do you take, do you think, did you look down to that model at all to yeah. see what Cumberland Farms could do? Surely, we look across channels and across the, the whole U.S. and certainly at, at uh, other uh, convenience operators that we admire that are doing things well. But, you know, very much so. New England has been a bit of a laggard in the introduction of of food stores, of fresh food convenience stores, as we're now presenting them. So we think it's a great opportunity to present New England, to present Rhode Island with a compelling offer. And when someone comes and shops at our stores today, we think they can get not only the right value on motor fuel, gasoline, they can get a terrific cup of coffee at a great value, they can get hot food, a breakfast sandwich otherwise, pick up the newspaper, pick up lottery tickets or a gift card for a birthday, whatever it may be. And we really think that's the quintessential form of convenience because we can satisfy so many needs across the store with over 3,000 items we sell in a store. People, uh, p- people, I have to think there were some people internally who said, boy, if we're going hard after coffee, this is New England, yeah. Dunkin' Donuts has a massive yeah. presence, yeah. not to, yeah. not to uh, swear yeah. in front of you of a yeah. competitor's yeah. Yeah. name, yeah. but yeah. you know. So how's the response then? Do you feel like, are you getting more share of the coffee drinking that yeah. happens? So much coffee gets drunk in, yeah. uh, in New England. Yeah. Very much so, and, and you know, again, we've been, we've been after it very, very hard and aggressively. Uh, we've got a, a 99 cent price point we've been on for a number of years. But most importantly, the coffee, again, we think the coffee, first and foremost, the product quality has to be there. And we work very, very hard to maintain terrific quality. So 99 cents, but a not so good <clears throat> cup of coffee, that wouldn't that, work. That would not work. And, and so we, we had to have the right product first. We coupled that with a very nice price point, the ability for the customer to make it their way, add as much cream, sugar, whatever they may like in exactly the way they would make it themselves. And the response has been overwhelming. We've been very, very pleased. We continue to grow the coffee business very, very satisfactorily, and we're happy with it. And of course, the new stores present that coffee offer really in its finest form. And yeah. the new stores more generally beyond, I know coffee's been at the core of it, but mm-hmm. have you see, are people responding the way you hoped to the, the broader offerings, the food-centric stores yeah. you talk yeah. about? Yeah, in fact, uh, in some instances, the, the demand is overwhelming us. I mean, just our ability to, to uh, you know, uh, have enough product on the grill to service the demand at times, peak times, uh, when you offer as much value as we do, uh, it's, it can be challenging. We, our teams are always up for it. But uh, we, we've had a terrific response to the products across the suite, again, whether it's the morning day part for breakfast items, fresh bakery products, or breakfast sandwiches, etc., or lunchtime, pizza, dinner time. Someone can bring a whole pie home for their family, uh, and it's a, it's a fantastic pizza. We make them ourselves, uh, and, uh, and we're proud of that. 
You get people yeah. hungry as they watch yeah. it, I'm yeah. sure is the yeah. idea. I mean, the, this has to have been an expensive undertaking. Yeah. You're doing, you're not just doing one or two stores here right. and there, you're doing a ton of yeah. your stores over into yeah. this. Um, were you concerned at all about right after we would go through this brutal recession mm -hmm. to make that kind of capital investment in a, your family's company, a mm -hmm. privately held company? I mean, what gave you the, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the, the, the enthusiasm that yeah. this can work? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I would give a lot of credit to the family for that. You know, we've had a, a history of persevering. Uh, again, going back to those family roots, we think very long term. We're not afraid of hard work. Uh, we absolutely you know, respect and treat our team members in the stores as well as we possibly can. And so when we put those things together in that long-term focus, you know, we invest for the next 10 to 20 years. So notwithstanding any, you know, economic uh, volatility in the short run, we're prepared to make the investments and do the right things for our team members in the stores and for our customers. And we're going to do that regardless of the economic climate at any given time. And do you think that's been an advantage for you, being privately held? Um, I sh I'm, a, I'm sure investment bankers have paraded through yeah. trying to get you oh, to yeah. go public, go on the stock yeah. market. But you've, yeah. you've withstood that for now. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you see that as an advantage? Uh, very much so. I mean, we, you know, again, we, uh, we like to take a very long-term focus uh, when we think about our business, whether it comes to decisions we make internally around how we compensate our team members and reward them, or whether it comes to the investments we make and being patient about letting them get up to the level that we're satisfied they're performing uh, appropriately. So we, we, uh, we absolutely uh, appreciate and very much desire the ability to think long term and you know frankly we don't think the right way to think about a business is to think about the next three months it's to think about think about in terms of years or decades and we think companies that can think that way again internally and externally will absolutely be positioned most especially for success in the years ahead. Yeah, and you're not alone. A lot of people saying that these yeah. days. All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to hear a bit more about the plans for Rhode Island, specifically with Cumberland mm -hmm. Farms, as well as some of the ways they're trying to give back to the community. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Thanks for being with us. And we're talking this week with the president and CEO of Cumberland Farms, Ari Hasiotis. He's the third generation in his family to run the business. It started as an actual Cumberland Farm in Cumberland, Rhode Island, as we talked about earlier. Um, so we were talking about these new stores, the new push on new stores, Ari. How much, I think you said at the top, 500-something uh, uh, stores you have now mm -hmm. in your portfolio. Are you looking to up that significantly uh, across your market in the coming years, or is it mostly redo what you have in those? It'll be a combination of both, but certainly we expect to grow significantly our uh, store count over the next decade. Uh, we think we can add hundreds more stores across New England. Certainly we expect Rhode Island to be a participant in that growth as well in a market in which we very much would like to continue to grow the business. And yeah. tell me about that. I know you've already, I think this year, 2015, you've already opened two new Correct. stores so far yeah. and, and more to come, right? Yeah, we have in fact four currently under construction as we speak. Those will open up uh, over the next several months. And over the next uh, several years, we expect we'll open probably another uh, 10, maybe 12 stores in Rhode Island. So uh, the, I'll push back with the skepticism. People might say, it seems like there are already a lot yeah, of Cumberland yeah, Farms out yeah. there. I mean, how, uh, is there still a lot of opportunity even when they're close together to yeah. add one more? I mean, how, how far apart do they need to be? You know, it, it, it's a great question. It often depends on the traffic flow, right? That we could have stores that are almost across the street, but if it's a divided road, it's yeah. a different traffic pattern. One may be going east, one may be going west and we could, we could be successful on both corners there, for example. So it depends, but we think there's plenty of opportunity in Rhode Island, again, across New England, and as we continue to build these stores that have such a compelling offer, it gives, a, we think, the customer just another chance to be loyal and say, that's Cumberland Farms and they've got really great stuff, and by the way, I'm going by one right now, I'm gonna stop in. And your competitors' ears perk up a little <laughs> hearing you say that, no doubt, too. You also, you had an interesting experiment. You, ha you now have a drive through Cumberland Farms yes. in South County, Rhode Island. You did as an experiment. Um, how, I know you haven't added a lot more, but you're still yeah. running that one. How's mm -hmm. that gone? What have you learned from it? We've learned a lot. You know, again, as we think about our business and what our what our key purpose is, ultimately, uh, one of those key purposes is to be able to provide convenience, right? To make every day easier for the customers that we're serving. So it was hard for us uh, in that vein not to consider drive-throughs, given the, the popularity they've had in, in the quick serve restaurant space or the coffee shop space. So we've been experimenting and we do that 
in many, many different areas, not just the drive through but certainly with the drive through We continue to learn that's, that can be a challenging one for us because, again, unlike a coffee shop that might have 20 or 30 items, we have 3,000 items. Right. So how do you execute that And can that people at the drive through did you want to be able to say, get me a coffee and, and some Tylenol? Yeah, we did. Okay. And, and we're, we're still kind of iterating around how best to deliver that, but, but uh, really anything was accessible. Through the drive-through, thought yeah. running around for your yeah, store very, <laughs> very much so. Yeah, oh. Roller skates, yeah. So I, uh, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk. Uh, your, your folks, very excited about this doing good program, mm -hmm. uh, which is your your charitable organization. Yeah. Um, I believe our twelve thousand dollars has gone out to Rhode Island-based yeah. organizations lately. So what's what is this program, and what's what do you think is yeah. unique about it compared yeah. to some other of these sorts? Well, of things? so when we open up a, a new store or we reopen a store that we happen to remodel or or knock down and rebuild. When we reintroduce our, ourselves to the community, uh, we want, one, obviously, to get folks excited about the new offer and come in and visit us. But what we came up with is what we think is a pretty novel approach to saying, you know, when you come in and visit the new store, we're going to also do something nice for the community. So through this Doing Good campaign, and specifically what we do with the reopening of the stores, we'll do 10 cents from every cup of coffee, again, hot or iced, or our fountain beverage program, our chill zone as we call it, where we will donate to a local charity. And for, for the two stores we opened, we, we partnered with some local elementary schools in each of the towns uh, that we opened stores. And, uh, and we will do that uh, continuously. And we've, we've funded everything from football teams needing helmets and just not having the funding, or libraries, or other youth, uh, youth programs, education programs. And it feels good to us to be able to give back. We are so much a part of New England. And the funny thing is that while we're a big chain, so many view us as part of New England, you know? Uh, and we want to continue that. So we give back at a local level through things like that. Scholarships we give out. We've given out over 900 scholarships to help kids get to college uh, just in the last couple of years, over 10 in the state of Rhode Island, for example. Only about a minute and a half left, but I, you've, you've, you've mentioned it repeatedly about the importance of your employees to you. Mm -hmm. And you put your money where your mouth is a yeah. couple of years ago because when the health care law was being implemented yeah. and pe places had to decide about 30 yeah. hours, yeah. are you part-time without insurance or yeah. full-time with, you went in a different direction for a lot of companies. Yeah. Tell yeah. us briefly about that and why you made yeah. that decision. So our, very simply stated, our employees are our heart and our soul. And that's how, again, thinking long term, we're going to do the right thing for our people. So irrespective of any regulation, we wanted to give greater access to health coverage. So we extended it to 12 to 1,500 additional team members. We've increased uh, folks that were considered part-time to be full-time to be accessible then for health insurance. Uh, we've also increased all other forms of compensation. We've introduced a value card, allows them to save on our products in the store every day which they very much appreciated. And we've been very, very aggressive in investing in their futures and opportunities for them to grow us. More than anything else, Ted, that's the most important thing for us is making sure our team members are going to be okay. Is that tough? About 30 seconds left. Yeah. That when you have, there is a lot of turnover often. You can be a starter job for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, is it tough to make that case to your board that we should invest a lot in these employees even if they're going to come through quickly? You know, again, going back to the family's roots, we believe in the people that make the business run every day for us in our store. So it hasn't been really all that difficult. We've really gotten behind it. We know that's the key to our future. And with the growth we plan over the coming years, we can give folks an opportunity, team members who come in as perhaps a starter job, say, hey, this is a pretty great place to work, and I want to grow here and maybe run a store and maybe someday run a group of stores. Just like you yeah. did once. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. All right, yeah. Ari Hasiatos, that's all the time we have. Thank you yeah. so much for being with me. Thank you. CEO and president of Cumberland Farms, thank you for joining us for this conversation. If you missed any of this episode or any other episode of Executive Suite, they're all on WPRI.com. See you back here next week. Great, thanks.